Professor Peter Newman, a professor of sustainability at Curtin University is in sorry, at Curtin University in Australia in sustainability at the Sustainability Policy Institute. Um, He's on the Board of Infrastructure Australia that is fundraising infrastructure for the long-term sustainability of Australian cities. Uh, and he mentioned this as his, uh, as his greatest claim to fame. He too was a municipal councillor in the city of Fremantle from 1976 to 1980, where he, and he still lives in Fremantle. I give you Peter Newman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this morning, uh, was a bit depressing for me. Um, David Pearson said uh, we have an unprecedented technological, political, economic and social challenge. Well, we know that and uh, it's especially uh, so that the wealthy cities of the world have to lead the way. And my job today is to try and show there is some hope. Uh, there is a lot happening and I'm uh, I've been involved in this climate change thing for nearly 40 years now, and I have never felt so hopeful. Um, I've produced two books recently, one on resilient cities and one more about Australian cities, but the, the stories that we have collected in there are meant to show that things are happening, things are changing, and I want to try and develop some of that today. The depressing part is about climate change and peak oil it has a positive in that it has essentially undermined the old economy. We have a crash that's happened and that is now uh, can be seen as a negative, but it is also a wonderful opportunity to now plan for a new future. A future where we have to create 80% less greenhouse gases by 2050. That's a, a generational change. And where peak oil, which basically happened last year, that uh, extraordinary spike there in the, in the price of oil, um, has undermined so much of what we were doing in the past. And I have a friend in Melbourne who says, never waste a good recession. This is... Uh, this is now what the UN are calling the Global Green New Deal, the opportunity for dramatic change. Let me give you the history of the world in two minutes. There has been a series of crashes in the past uh, which have led to waves of innovation. When cities like this and most of the major cities of the world were formed, uh, in the first wave of innovation, they were based around water transport. And in the 1840s, there was a massive international depression. And out of it came steam power and railroads. And cities began to form along the tracks. Different kinds of cities formed. Then in the 1890s, there was a massive crash. And out of it came electricity, which transformed our cities. You can't imagine what what that was to, to create a new future for cities and particularly electric trams, electric trains that spread cities out. And then in the 1930s, the depression we mostly know about, there was a major economic decline and out of it came a new era with cheap oil, automobiles and trucks and the, uh, the sprawl that we are used to. That kind of era is over. That is part of that fourth wave which is now in decline. And we have a new economy emerging, two key parts to it, the digital revolution and the sustainability revolution. Out of this is coming a combination of new technologies that are providing hope for our future. The future is to be smart and sustainable. They come together, IT and ET, and we are beginning to see now what it means for our cities. Our book tries to show there are seven key city advances that are needed and are, which are already emerging 
in this growing new economy. And I'll go quickly through each of them. The renewable energy city, there are many cities that are, have a, a claim to uh, leading the way in this. Adelaide is probably our best in Australia, where we now have 20% uh, renewables and uh, plans for considerably more. Europe certainly began the process of, of uh, doing this far more quickly than, than other cities. And now we have a situation of defining, redefining urban spaces as power production opportunities. There's a new technology developed out of my town called wind pods, which you can put on the roof line. Uh, it's a vertical axis system that enables very local wind movements to be picked up and in incredibly efficiently. These are now being exported to China. They'll be on the Shanghai Bank that's being built. And they are being manufactured by a car parts manufacturer. That is the new green economy emerging. We have examples now of renewable energy-based homes. This one just down the road here, the uh, Riverdale Net Zero home. The interesting statistic for me is that last year was peak fossil fuel power investment. That's a really important peak because for the first time there was more investment in renewable power than in fossil fuel power. That's a very significant transition point. It's the first time that happened and it's, it, it signals a new future. It's been growing exponentially. We are meant to worry about exponential growth. But if it's working for us, working to create hopeful solutions, exponential growth is dramatic. We can see how, as it begins to take up, it can dramatically change our cities. So that those kind of graphs that the IEA presented this morning, which just continue on business as usual, essentially, um, don't have to happen at all. In California next year is a very significant uh, uh, event in that grid parity in the price of power will reach, renewable energy will reach that of fossil fuels as, as the first place to show that. The key issue still is about storage of renewables and I want to come back to that. The second approach is about carbon neutral cities. And there are many local governments, many businesses now going carbon neutral. And uh, just last week, a major LNG project in Western Australia announced $100 million of offsets that will help to produce this major ecological reserve uh, stretching nearly 2,000 kilometres across Western Australia. There are all kinds of innovations in carbon neutral, like the light rail in Calgary. The biophilic city is where we bring biodiversity and local food into the city so that it is regenerating. This is a, a green wall in Paris. Uh, there are green roofs now all over the place. Toronto's new ordinance announced last week uh, is massive and the, the kind of changes to even Ford Motor Works in, uh, in Dearborn, Michigan, where bird life is now nesting on the, uh, the roof. The distributed city is a real opportunity for local governments because most of those technologies that I mentioned are small scale. The sustainability technologies work best at local government level. Water, energy and waste systems are going to be more and more under the control of local government. and the Sydney Green Transformers as an example of how that's being planned. The eco-efficient city where we can have major factor four, factor five reductions because of uh, the way we use our wastes is now being planned in places like Hammersby Showstat. Place-based cities are where we have a much greater emphasis on the local economy by creating a stronger sense of place. The human side of the city is just as important as that technological side and it means we need special places. This is a special place for us near where I live. It has been recreated as a, a sacred site uh, telling the story of the area. 
Place-based cities also need to emphasise